Hello and welcome everyone. Today, we start a new challenge map. Now, as is normal, I really enjoy playing through challenge maps when I know nothing about them, like whatsoever, not even their format or, you know, even their offer or how it plays. I only need to know like how to launch it and that's basically all I want to know. So that's why I'm playing this one. The map's name is Sandra's Folly. This one got recommended, recommended to me by Crackbrain, if I remember correctly. He is like a local resident guy on Twitch. He also streams, by the way, you can check him out. So, yeah, I'm actually pretty hopeful for this one, and hopefully it's gonna be like another good, nice adventure of a challenge map. And before we begin, I also want to ask you of a quick little favor, okay? I'm currently being sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I had a campaign with them on Twitch. I had like a big stream, and it would help me tremendously if you were to download the raid for the link below and level up to level 10. It takes about 15 minutes, and you'd basically be supporting me directly, okay? So, yeah, hopefully you can do that for me. Thank you so much in advance. So, on to Sander's Folly. Sander Payne. This is the scenario description, by the way. Sander Payne was always a good student. He liked to study. He often received high marks on his tests. His favorite subject was history, and he studied it feverishly. feverishly. Some thought he was obsessed, but nobody knew just how far he would go. Okay. So, we're playing as Sander Payne, a magi specialist with the face of Vintius, uh, playing at Tower. Of course, we are a scholar. We like history. So of course we play Tower, and we are Magic Specialists, so let's go! Sandus Folly, Normal Difficulty, version 1.6, created by Timothy V. Duncan. Thank you, Timothy, for bringing this masterpiece, hopefully, to us. Wait, you cannot see. Okay, so here we go. And so, Professor Orgrim says, his eyes peering condescendingly over his wire rimmed spec spectacles, your theory, Mr. Payne, is not only incorrect, but it is merely ridiculous. Eric LeBlanc was not, as he seemed to think, merely a coward who got lucky. Sure, King LeBlanc was aided by many enchanted artifacts, but magic, I will remind you, is never a substitute for bravery and raw intelligence. LeBlanc clearly outwitted the necromancers Sagamiris at Baron's Ford through nothing more than his own military genius. The professor finishes his oratory with his uh, nose high in the air. But sir, you reply, reaching for a short sack of papers, sitting at your desk. Some of the other students frown at you as you start uh, sifting through them. There are counts, men who are actually at the battle. Nothing but the lies of Blackhearts with Sully LeBlanc's name. Argument turns, holding up a gnarled old hand to forestall. Any other arguments from the students? Galen owes everything. It is today to the valiant actions of King LeBlanc and his generals. These are established facts. Now, are there any further questions? The professor stands still for several seconds. He is, is perked to receive any other deviant historical analysis that he could shoot down. Not content to let uh, matters rest, you raise your hand again, but Professor, I don't understand. That is about enough for me, Sander. Ogham replies, Ogham's reply is short and taut, like a stretched rope. His eyes meet yours and glare angrily. We are out of time anyway. After several more seconds um, of a reproachful silence, Ogham's features uh, relax and turn to the rest of the class. Remember, students, he said. Your senior thesis drafts are due in two weeks. I have regular office hours if you would like to discuss your topics with me. Ogham's lingering stare at you before, uh, stare at you before he storms out of the room suggests uh, that uh, this last bit was meant for you. Sighing, you pack up your belongings and file with the rest of the students out of the class. While walking towards your lockbox after class, you are plagued by disturbing thoughts the, the oligarchy that seemed to rule the history department at Galen University is infuriating. They are so intolerant of deviant history view, historical views. The hypocrites, you growl, punching a fist into the wall. Damn it! You yell again, you yell again clutching your now bruised hand. They preach the necessity of thinking for yourself and practicing historical objectivity, and then they ignore obvious facts because they are afraid of besmirching the image of a long dead hero. It is perplexing, 
irritating, frustrating, and makes you wish you hadn't decided to major in the mystic history. Because you weren't forced to, all of the other students know you by reputation. Sandra Payne, the smartest guy in school, since being at the elementary level, you have always scored at the top of everything. Math, science, language, history. It didn't even matter what subject you pursued, you were good at all of them. Even before you entered college, two years earlier than is normally recommended, you had received scholarships and offers from every department to major in their field of study. But you chose history without even giving the others a moment of consideration. It had seemed too interesting learning about the past, that which makes the present the present. You wanted to investigate the past in the hopes of improving the future. But now in your senior year, you question that choice because how could you learn? How can you learn from the past if you refuse to acknowledge it? And then there's a matter of your thesis. You think again as you pack up your books. Each student is given a small lockbox somewhere on the university where they can store their belongings for the day. Of course, to get a good grade, and good grades are necessary if you ever hope to make it into celestial order of magic, you will still have to kiss their asses and just write about what they want to hear. Still, it is tempting to do something unconventional to really show them that you are not afraid to find the truth. But they simply won't believe you unless you go to drastic lengths to, uh, to obtain proof. See you tomorrow, Geek Boy. An oddly dressed uh, pillar of muscle named Thomas Lohman yells at you, breaking your concentration. As he and his uh, passé of buddies storm down the main hall of the university, one of the meaner jocks smack you on the head as he stomps past, um, eliciting a round of howling laughter from the other boys. Your books and papers uh, scatter onto the floor as your body goes flying towards the wall. You grumble to yourself as you pick up your papers and pens from the floor. What would it you give to be a little bit, a little stronger and bigger? Suddenly, a shrill sound resonates down the hall. The four, the four o'clock bell. You curse. I'm late. Scrambling wildly, you pick up your remaining things and run down the hallway causing the blue Galen banners along the walls to flutter in your wake. A note to the player, unfortunately, you are impoverished. You are an impoverished college student. And although you are on the full scholarship, every penny you earn must go into your education. Sorry, that's the way the world works. Alright. So, there we go. We are in the world of... I don't know what kind of like world setting this is, but we are Sandra Payne. We are naturally gifted early into the university. We study history, but the but the faculty for history is um, not very good right now, huh? Okay. So we have this castle town that is Galen Dale. I suppose this is where our university lies. Uh huh. We can go inside, and we have stabled up. Okay, so we begin our adventure, huh? Can we put in... No, we cannot, like, deposit this unit or anything. The gale in the highway is paved in stone. Dents of every shape and color squat outside the great sovereign gate of Galen Dale. The merchants uh, in equally colorful clothing call out to pedestrians from behind, long display tables, hundreds of shouting, smelly people mill about trying to sniff out good deals on everything from kitchenware to quick uh, panickies, uh, just uh, for just about every disease you can imagine. It is deep uh, summer and a murky haze from the violent sun above mixes with the dust and dirt below to make a, a sweltering amalgamation of uncomfortable conditions. In your blue university robes, you are sweating as profusely as a decapitated man bleeds, only adding to your general discomfort. To the south, you see Marlin Tower. To the west, um, and um, Skykiss to the east. You see Marlin Tower to the west, and uh, Skykiss to the east. At least you think to yourself, the crowds should be dispersed somewhat once you leave the immediate vicinity of Galen Dale. Alright. Now, a century, we have a conservatory. When the crowds, uh, 
With the crowd's fan, you can at least breathe again. Although the air, no less dense, and the sun is no less hot, you pause for a second to collect your thoughts. Ah oh, yes, you finally remember. Before returning home, a small woodcutter's cottage uh, to the southeast uh, for your vacation, you had two errands to run. Errands important to complete if your plan is to work. First, to the uh, great library to the west, and second, your friend Michael had asked you to meet him at the River Inn sometime before tomorrow evening. Before tomorrow evening. So I guess I have to do it by one on two. River Inn. Don't really know what that is yet. Hmm. Oh, by the way, I have like a secondary hero that I, ju I just noticed. So wait. To the Great Library to the West. Wait, but like there's nothing at the West. What? I mean, West is here. It's nothing. Alright. Dear Pac-Man. Wait, what is their hero like? We don't even have a spellbook yet, by the way. Yikes. Was there a mage called over here that I could buy a spellbook from? With Wait, I'm like too poor anyway. Do I have any income? I have 500 gold income because I have this uh, little town over here, I guess. From here, we could buy a hero. Alright, maybe sometime down the line. I mean, oh, yeah, actually, it said that every single coin goes to education, right? So I guess saying that's gonna be still a thing. Oh, it's the narrator. <laughs> okay. The narrator is a uh, chain lightning specialist without a spell bug. Alright. Greetings, noble storyteller. You have again been summoned by Al Gamash, the Lord of Tales, to recite the story of an unknown hero to the observer from the other side of the Great Glass Barrier. He who sits on the chair. Um, he, he who even now looks down upon the, our world with interest in our affairs, his timelessness was very satisfied with your work uh, before. Oh, sorry, I should have that off. Hmm, yes, we're good. So, let's continue. His timelessness was very satisfied with your work before in the land of um, Aref, and although the story of Roger. A Valkenborg was a good one. You recorded the story with expertise and a lack of bias, but your skill at storytelling is needed again. Celestial narrator, for on another world very far away from Aerith, another young man is about to embark on an adventure, although he does not yet know it. The deeds of this young boy will be instrumental in the forming of the region's history, and they should be recorded now for future generations to admire. Or perhaps to serve as a warning, this will, of course, be up to you to decide. Therefore, without further uh, procrastination, I welcome you to Eve, a land of magic very different from Aerith. Our story begins with a Sander, begins with Sander Payne, a young scholar studying in the University of Galen Dale, deep within the heart of Kingdom of Eve. Okay, so wait, it's Eve. It's the, it's Eve. Maybe this was what the Hussar was talking about all along during the TV2 match. Anyway. Good luck, my friend. And remember, your story is being read by Face Beyond the Glass. So tell it well. Alright. Please follow the Path of Time narrator. You will be told when to proceed from chapter to chapter. Okay. I wasn't told not to proceed, so I may as well proceed. Chapter 1, in the presence of greatness. Okay, I... yeah? Okay. Uh, let's check this out. Do we should attack? No, I don't wish I attack. This is, uh... No, by lots of griffins and a pack of royal griffins. Oh, this is like the old conservatories that are like massively underguarded, huh? Alright, interesting. Professor Algum's house, North, note to students, remember stu students, your thesis are due in two weeks, come see me if you need help. Algum doesn't seem like an entirely bad deal. Professor Algum's house is small but cozy, a quaint fire crackles in the, in the hearth and you are greeted by a blast of hot air as you enter his living chambers. 
The Vi's warmth is not matched by the professor himself, who eyes you coldly before speaking. Well, well, Mr. Potter. <clears throat> I almost said Mr. Potter here, because that's the scenario that I'm envisioning in my head here, kind of. Came to discuss your thesis. He barks. Damn, bro. You nod and hand him a bundle of your notes. He grabs them skeptically, looks through them briefly, and then chuckles. Mr. Payne, you are going to do much better than this. You're going to have to do much better than this. While I cannot forbid you from pursuing this ridiculous topic, I am quite able to fail you if you can't find any better evidence than the ramblings of soldiers that died well over a century ago. Please, don't waste my time. Come back when you've learned a bit more about your topic. Then we'll talk about giving you that degree you've always wanted. He shows you somewhat unkindly to the door and bids you farewell. Once outside, you clench your fist in anger. Damn that man, you grumble. You'll show him. If your plan comes to fruition, you'll have all the evidence you need. You storm off, thinking how wonderful it will be to see the look on his face when you return with the knowledge of the truth. I have to do this in two weeks? Damn, bro. Alright. Hopefully I can uh, pick up the pace then, huh? Alright. Okay, let's go. You spend what seems like several hours pacing back and forth in the waiting room outside of the royal offices. The castle is almost identical to Galen Dale you know of in your time, save for a few uh, tapestries and sculptures here and there. It is amazing to you how some places seem uh, immune to the ravages of time while well, following the liverished, deliveried servant who directed you to this room, you had taken almost four pages of notes of your journal. This thesis you decided was going to be smashing success, provided, of course, the king and his advisors believe you are a member of the Celestial Order. The servants at the gate had believed easily enough, but then again they were just servants. The king himself could afford to be a little skeptical. This is ridiculous! Adventures aren't supposed to be boring. Michael whines for at least the 30th time. While in town, he had forced you to stop at a clothing store where he had bought the most ridiculous outfit, complete with puffy slash silk sleeves, baggy breeches, and the most absurd white brand feathered hat. He looked like a genuine idiot. Hey, El Tonto. But at the same time, almost managed to pull off the part of a member. Uh, of a um, ga Gaelish uh, nobility rather well. If it wasn't for his uh, somewhat backwater accent and unfortunate uh, habit of biting his fingernails, he could almost pass for a lord of the highest station. You didn't ask him where he got the money for such a costume, and you didn't accept when he offered uh, to buy you one as well. As a feigned member of the Celestial Order, you had to be content with white rolls for the, for the time being. Finally, the great oak door opens, and an old balding man wearing a blue velvet suit approaches. He carries a long stick, a walking cane perhaps, and points at you with a Mage Pain, he says with a, an air of self-importance. His Majesty King LeBlanc will see you now, but you must make it quick. You must be dressed for battle within, an, uh, within the hour and be ready to march south that he may smite down the evil hordes of Sagamiris. That's how I imagine like old mages to talk, I guess. It is amazing to you how brave and assured of victory people can be when they are not the ones doing the fighting. Although many castle residents were going, to, uh, were going about their lives normally, you were nearly run over twice in the hallways by groups of swordsmen and even the occasional colonel or general. The whole place was in an uproar as preparations were being made to march south. Thank you, mister. You replied to the man standing up uh, from your chair. Jeeves. Hey, he's gonna repair again. He finishes um, for you, turning on his heel and starting to walk back through the door. Please, follow me! Michael trails after you, mumbling something about how butlers always seem to have the same name. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, the grand audience chamber is enormous, causing you to gasp in disbelief. You have never seen it before. The king himself is sitting, bedecked in the finest blue silk robes, atop of a steel throne on a dais at the other end of the room. A golden crown sits casually on top of his head. It is studded up appropriately enough with the most brilliant blue sapphires you've ever seen. Not that you've seen many. A long blue carpet extends from the raised platform across the room back to the door through which you just entered. Several gods carrying long swords, the king's elite guard, stand like statues at regular intervals along the carpet. They eye you with suspicion as you make your way towards the de towards the dais. I actually don't know this word, but I'm guessing it's like maybe like um a platform? My context? I don't know. Anyway, I make my way to the king, right? Not surprising, they would be tense. You decide, nothing twitching fingers, uh, hovered above he the hills of their swords. A mage is never trustworthy because you can't force them to leave their weapons outside. Although the Celestial Order has since recorded the history, always been on friendly terms with the aristocracy that ruled Galen, they are an order that uh, operates under its own autonomy and therefore, as far as guards are concerned, not completely trustworthy. You approach King, radiating as much of self-importance as you can possibly muster in your somewhat unconvincing youthful body. A guard wearing a badge of intermediate office suddenly steps in front of you. That's far enough, Mageling, he says sternly. You can address his majesty from here. State your name and business, if you please. Knuckle jerks to a stop behind you. You can lend your teeth uh, in irritation before turning back to the man in front of you. King Eric LeBlanc is everything that the tales are told. Strong, masculine features. An old brown beard, flecked with gray wise, almost black eyes. A handsome face. No wonder people had him in such great esteem. Your eyes wander to the King's Rhine, where the armed officer who stopped you had retaken his place. And to the left, um, to your dismay, it is a white robed member of the Celestial Order, whose green eyes are at this moment scrutinizing you like a cat scrutinizes a mouse caught in his claws. He hadn't expected to be challenged by another member of the Order, a challenge uh, which you, having no knowledge of real magic, would certainly fail. Well, the armed man says, jerking you back to the conversation, speak. Your Majesty, by the way, I don't know, I probably should be, shouldn't be reading this chapter yet. I went further without instructions, but you know what? We're too feet far deep in. I guess we're going to be a little bit spoiled, but let's go. Your Majesty, you say finally with a bow. I, uh, you search for something to say. That is the order sends me bearing their pledge of support, and they wish you well on the journey to the south. I have been sent to assist you as an observer, for the historical chronicles, of course. The plan seemed like a good one at the time, and you, and you thought it might just have a chance of succeeding. The king yawns. You made the wizards for all your intelligence and talent with the arcane have about as much common sense as a donkey. Your order. He says, leaning forward, has, Your order has already sent me someone for that very purpose, and while I am grateful for their dedication to my cause, if they can't send me anything better than their pledge of assistance and neutral observers, then I'd be happy if you all stop wasting my time. I don't need more than one. He indicates the wizard to his left. I'm sure you must know, wizard uh, Dion. Fion? You shake your head, giving Fion a professional look of courtesy. I'm sorry we haven't met. My name is Mage Payne, the wizard, a young man in his mid-thirties with a long black hair tied into a ponytail, gives you a curt nod, and his eyes again straight to the medallion at your chest. He is clearly not convinced of your story, but has elected to give you the benefit of the doubt, at least in public. And who is this man you bring with you? The king asks, indicating Michael behind him. Mages seldom travel with company. 
You open your mouth to deliver your prepared excuse, but, but you are interrupted when Michael struts uh, around you, both so low that his forehead almost hits the floor, presents his uh, feathered hat to the king and declares loudly, with exuberance, My liege, I am Lord Michael Anderson of House Moray from Kingdom of Harpline, traveling with the good maid, Sander Pay, because I so wanted to meet your Lord uh, Majesty. Michael bow bows again for good measure. You could just strangle him for this ridiculous show. Harkwine, the king says. Now, I haven't seen someone from Harkwine in many years. Tell me, why did you wish to meet me? You place a warning hand on Michael's shoulder, but he continues unheedful of it. Well, my lord, we are really just interested in accompanying you to Baron's Ford. Very interested. Very interesting, yes. Uh, why? What is going on at Baron's Ford? The officers at the King's right ask all of a sudden. You suddenly are overtaken by a fit of anxiety. This is very bad. You decide. Why would Michael just shut up for once? Nothing. He just wants to see the city. Yeah, you say nervously. What city? The king demands sternly. There is no city there. Just a tiny farming village. Why are you sweating, Mage Bane? What is going to happen at Baron's Ford? Uh, you stammer. Thinking of some excuse, you lick your lips. Well, sire, you see, there's this... Well, we think there might be an ambush, but I'm not sure... The officer suddenly, the officer suddenly dodged forward. Ambush! He yells. Segamiris has set an ambush at Baron's Ford. You can only nod. Lying more will make matters worse. How do you know? You can't tell them the truth, never the truth, making up a lie, quickly, you reply. Well, we passed through there, and saw some undead lurking around, that is probably nothing. My friend is just a little overzealous, that's all. You should just watch as you planned, and we'll just observe. You turn to make it, uh, you turn to make a hasty exit, but uh, are stopped by a strong hand on your arm, it is the officer. My liege, if there is even the possibility of an ambush, you must not march south. You cannot. Your life is too valuable, the officer says. The king frowns and gives you an angry stare, although you can't comprehend why. Dion's uh, features are shaped with casual interest at this uh, turn of events. Then LeBlanc's features relax and he is once again the handsome hero. Perhaps you are right, Lord Morgan. He replies his dark eye. He replies, his dark eyes are still on you, but certainly my men will lose heart if they are to march south without me. I cannot have that. What a cool king, actually, by the way. LeBlanc seems somehow insincere. You can't put uh, your finger on why. Hmm, maybe he's looking for an excuse. Okay, Bane is onto something. Something in the tone of his voice just seemed, well, oily. Smug, perhaps you should go and lead them, Jared. Oh. The officer shakes his head. This must be the Jared Morgan you read about in all your accounts. He does not strike you as a, a valiant figure. He radiates authority and goodwill, more so than even the king, from which you get a surprisingly uneasy feeling. Perhaps it's just uh, being in the presence of such an important historical figure. No, my king. As the Castellan of Galen Dale, my place is here with you. The men of Galen need to keep you safe. Your cousin, Sir Albon, is already on the field and in control. He is an able leader, if a bit over-anxious at times. Certainly, he can lead the men south and fight off any ambush. If they get to Baron's Ford they, and there is nothing, then he can send the word north and then we can join them. Is that... Capacetic? Another word that I don't know. I'm probably going to learn a lot from this map, huh? I'm guessing this would be like a synonym for unreasonable. Is that unreasonable? I'm guessing is what he's trying to say. Okay. Uh, the king considers for a moment and then replies, suddenly happy with the plan of action. Yes, that is good. Ready a messenger to send uh, Sir Alban immediately. In a panic, for this is not the way history was supposed to happen at all. Your thesis was turned into a disaster that was uh, threatening your very future. My lord, you interrupt. 
Please reconsider. Be Wait, actually, I realize what's going on now. Oh my god, did we travel back to the future? I mean, back to the past? Oh no. And now we're changing the, uh, the course of history? We wanted to be an observer. But now... Okay! This map is turning into, like, a pretty interesting story. And the fact that we ended up, you know, being the... Uh, you know... Kind of reading through the eyes of the narrator is maybe not so good. Well, we'll see. In a panic, uh, for this is not the way the history was supposed to happen at all. Your thesis was turning into a disaster that was threatening your very future. My lord, you interrupt. Please reconsider. The men need your presence. How can they defeat an army of undead without you? The king just laughs. They don't need to crush dead bones. So they don't even need to crush dead bones and running flesh. Dying last with the king, although his eyes never leave you. Thinking quickly, you go, you interrupt again, your voice filled with urgency. Then allow me to go south with them, my lord. I will deliver your message. I need to observe the events anyway. The king glares at you with suspicion, but finally consents. All right, Mageling, go south and tell Sir Alban. Take the sash as proof of my orders. He hands you a blue and gold scarf imprinted with the king's seal. You find the king and walk uh, hurriedly out of one uh, out of the front room. Your head runs with terrible thoughts. Michael trails behind you, but you ignore him. This is all his fault to think it is you marching south now instead of the king. But what will happen if, without the LeBlanc and the garrison of the castle, Galen loses at the Baron's Ford? And uh, how can you, a measly student, a mage imposter with no magical or military talent, prevent it from happening? Okay. The end of chapter one. Uh, sure, there's gonna be like uh, quite a bit here, huh? What do you see over here? This is Eric LeBlanc. And this is gonna be Sir Alban. He's leading an army. Wait, so this is Sir Alban, that is south, that, uh, and this is going to be the undead threat over here. This is Baron's Ford. Uh, this is the place we're supposed to protect from the undead invasion. This is possibly where, like, about about where the ambush is going to happen. And uh, Eric should be heading down to help. Wait, this is Galen Dale? And this is Galen Dale. Oh, okay. So this is Galen Dale's probably at different times of the timeline. And in order to complete our thesis, we're going to be probably traveling somehow back to the future. I mean, back to the past. I don't think we should be, like, reading too much more into this, because we got, like, hell's full there. <laughs> Not in, like, the most horrible way, but still, sure. Somebody wanted to meet me at some inn by the end of week one. Okay. Oh yeah, this is the River Inn, by the end of tomorrow's evening, so there we go. The River Inn gets its name from the fact that it is actually suspended partially above a narrow turn in the Aeron River. Many men fear to enter the establishment because they worry that one day it will topple due to its uh, precarious uh, perch over the rocky slopes into the river's rushing waters. Uh, frequenting visitors uh, simply figure that uh, since it hasn't fallen in by now, it isn't likely to anytime soon. And they don't complain either, because the inn's uh, rather tenuous outside appearance only serves to keep the foreign riffraff uh, from cluttering up their favorite late night hotspot. When you make your way inside, you are assaulted by a mixture of pleasant aromas, the smoke from the large fire, in the middle of the main room, smells of honey and um, basing, basing ham, odors of gravy and roasting potatoes. Ooh, potatoes. Your mouth begins to water immediately as you scan the room for your friend, Michael. Thankfully, the inn isn't too full, so it uh, only takes you a few moments before your spot has a uh, stunted form over in a corner. Sharing a mug of ale and probably a whole slew of embellished uh, stories with a group of would-be young adventurers. As you approach, Michael gestures towards you and laughs. And then, Sander here, he stabs the little green gremlin with his short sword. Yes! And me and him 
We went running with a bag full of gold and gems. Now that was an adventure. What did the other young say? Turn to you with a questioning look, to which you respond by rolling eyes, seeing that you're not going to go along with his fight. Seeing that they are not going to go along with his fabrication, Michael frowns and says, uh, sending his glass down. Ah, okay, you got me. That part was made up. Sanders here wouldn't know how to use a sword in the fight. He just tried to bore them with his books, yes. Michael starts laughing at his own joke as the other boys get up and leave, some of them mumbling about how they were never fooled by Michael's story. Even though just a few seconds ago they were drooling over his tail like a pack of dogs at a pig slaughtering. Look at what you did! You scared him off! Michael, uh, throttled, chugging some of the dark brown liquid in his mug. Michael Anderson had been an orphan since he was six and made a living now with a motley assortment of odd jobs which he claimed was just a temporary thing until his career as a hired adventurer picked up. Well, it was over the six years temporary thing and despite the fact he was nearly 21, he still sat in the inn nearly every evening waiting hopefully for somebody to come along and hire him for an adventure. In some ways, you feel sorry for the for the man. He has a good heart, but a dumb head, and no amount of uh, coaxing by you has ever been able to convince him to try to get an education. Books is for standing on. Books is for standing on, so you can reach high shelves. Nothing else. He always laughs. <laughs> okay, all right. Sighing, you return to the business at hand. You're due back at the lumber mill. You're home for the last 16 years, and you can't deal with Michael's really eccentric eccentricities tonight. Not after all the stress um, of your pieces. Did you find what I asked for? Did you get it? Michael frowns again and sets down his glass. My, what are we all grumpy for, huh? Yeah, I got your stinker, Mercury. Though I gotta ask, what the hell you want it for? I mean, nobody just asks for Mercury, it stinks of something illegal, and that's what it does. Though he is pretending to be uh, disapproving, you know the deep inside, he is hoping that he can convince you to let him tag along in whatever you're planning. Well, curse you for having a caring soul, fine, you can come with me, but I can't tell you till we get there. Oh, and bring that bow of yours, it, it may come in handy. Michael's eyes up, eyes light up as he runs to fetch his bow and the mercury you requested. Now, south to the lumber mills. All right. Send a pain of song treasure. Both Elvin Sherwood. All right. So that was uh, Michael, huh? So basically, a guy that wants to be an adventurer is kind of an idiot, and uh, yeah, he did the entire thing at the king's play. Sure. Uh, Northeast, River Inn, that's where we were. Uh, Morhen Monastery. Then south we have Galen's Harbor, Baron's Ford, and uh, Sagoria. North we have Galen's Dale, southwest we have... Um, Visit Scenic Selway Point. Alright, sure. East is King's Lumber Mills. Okay, so we have to go to the Lumber Mills right now, right? Away we go. Dug behind a thick tangle of gnarled oak trees is a small cottage, your house. It has been 16 years since you and your family moved here. You were only seven then, and it was long before your mother died of consumption. You can distinctly remember the first time you walked up uh, this narrow little trail. It was autumn, and your father had just received word that the previous king's uh, lumberjack, a big bull of a man named John Carroll, who despite uh, his graying hair, had sagging skin, was as tough as the giant trees uh, that he felled for a living, had passed away suddenly in the night. 
Your father, low in pain, nicknamed by the folks at the uh, River Inn, Chopper, was the lumberjack down at Aaron Mill and was called to take uh, Carol's place as King's lumberjack. Almost immediately, your whole uh, family, father, mother, self, and younger sister, packed up their things and headed north um, for their new home. Remember clearly how your father beamed as the cottage came into view through the dense forest, a glowing proud smile on his face. Despite uh, the somewhat shabby appearance of the house and, uh, and his facilities, but Dad didn't seem to care. He just uh, slung down his enormous axe into the dirt, and gave all of you a big hug in his massive arms, and bellowed, Welcome to Gillendale, this is home. It didn't seem uh, much uh, like home anymore. Putting aside the fact that you spend most of your time at the university, nothing has been the same since mom died. When your mother perished, she couldn't uh, even speak. Every time she opened her mouth, blood ran out of it, uh, blood ran out of it, thick with mucus, like magma issuing sluggishly from a dying volcano. Your father had uh, stayed by her side for days. Telling her stories, making her smile, despite the pain she must have been feeling with every cough and breath. When Lai finally left her, your father didn't howl or yell or pump his fist at the heavens. Rather, he carried her body outside and buried her silently, and then spent the next week in the forest taking his frustration out on the trees with his axe. Still, he has never been a happy man since. Where before he would uh, always entertain his children, after her death, he simply spent all his time in quiet reflection, often walking down to the river to spend the evening smoking his pipe and throwing rocks into the slowly moving water. Even when he lost his arm in a logging accident, it didn't stop him from engaging in his only solace, and you grew up without him. Now, as you make your way inside, you realize your father is not here. He still takes his job seriously. It's all he has left. And if he does not come home tonight, it won't be uh, until very late. He sniffed back at there. It would have been nice to see him as he used to be. His big arms crushing the breath out of you as he gave you a hug. Now, he was always happy. So happy to see you when you came back from school. Now you just have an empty house filled with shadows of evening and the sounds of sad solitude to greet you. Creepy, huh? Knockout says as he pushes through the door after you. Ain't nobody home? No, you shout back. Your emotions flaring. Nobody's ever home. Sister's still at school and dad is dead. To Michael's con uh, concerned look, you just sigh. Never mind, you say heavily. Let's just get some food. We're going to need him. We going on an adventure, Mike will ask for the 50th time. Where are we going, huh? Just wait, you snap back while rummaging through the cabinets. Finally you find a loaf of bread and a jar of honey. It will have to do. You'll know soon enough, remember the old mines uh, to the east uh, through the forest. We're going there. Everything is ready, just bring that mercury. Ain't you going to leave your dad a note telling him you're going to be gone? Malkal asks you, asks as you are making your way towards the exit uh, to the cottage. He wouldn't get it, even if he, he cared, you reply. Dad didn't know how to read. Okay. So wait, well... What are we doing? In front of you, almost made invisible by a tangle of vines and bushy undergro undergrowth, is the gaping maw of an enormous cave. Several abandoned, overturned, and rusting vine carts lie outside of the cave opening, some of them still partially filled with ore, gold, and even a few gems. A whistling wind emanates uh, from the cave's opening. Bringing with it uh, the smells of underground, mold, heart water, fungus, dampness, death. This place haunted. Yes, Michael says uh, from behind you. A bag filled with mercury slung over one shoulder uh, and his trusty bow, bow over another. He sounded more excited than scared. 
What are we gonna do in there? He asks. You'll see. You say warily, tired of his incessant questioning. The abandoned mines are just as you remember them, dank and filled with running water. Little streams, after years of steady flow, cutting into the rocks, run alongside the floor of the cavern and make and more water drips from Stalasis. Stalastities uh, in the ceiling. It is cold down here, not a wintry cold, but a cold like death that makes you shiver, even though, as far as the uh, temperatures go, you're, you've experienced much worse. Your little torch uh, dispels darkness only immediately in front of you and sputters with every gust of air. Silently, you pray to whatever gods are, are, are out there that your flame doesn't go out. The thought of being stuck down here, in the darkness, is almost too much to bear. The one way entrance, we have a few lights. We have Vampire. A small group of goblins jump out as you reach for the cart of gold. Get away, little boy, this is our gold. Go back before I eat you. Their leader hisses, and you can feel Michael just itching to plunge into battle against these creatures. But you hold them off. Valiant as he may be, his bow will only kill one of them before they surround you and follow through on their promise. Okay, I... I guess we don't go here. Sure. You finally reach the place uh, that you have been looking for, a small alcove between two natural stone pillars. You chose this place because the magic demands an area of strong earth power, and this seemed like a, like as a good, as good a place as any. You couldn't find any definition in the book uh, of a place of strong earth power, so you figured a cave was your best bet. A small altar consisting of a large flat rock lies in front of you. Two half used candles and a large moth eaten book opened to a page somewhere in the middle of its uh, contents lie on top of it. Behind the altar, the result of many days of painstaking work stands as a testament to your diligence. What looks like an arced doorway without a door formed by 21 precisely shaped rocks, each rock marked with a uh, precisely carved rune. The keystone made of jade reflects the light of your torch, casting the entire room in an eerie green light. This place looks freaky. Michael comes up behind you and drops the sack full of mercury. My god, he says in astonishment, what is this place? This, my friend, you apply lighting the large candles on the altar, is my thesis project. Your friend turns to you and says, his eyes bent in confusion, but I thought you were a history major. <laughs> I am, you smirk. And what better way to study history than be there? Okay, so you were right on the, tra on the time travel part. Well, I mean, it's really obvious, yeah. A confused look by Michael reveals that he doesn't understand. It's simple, you explain. I want to study Eric LeBlanc. That's my topic. But the best sources of information to support my thesis are second-hand accounts, which aren't sufficient according to my professor, especially because my topic is uh, somewhat unorthodox. So, you conclude, beaming at your own brilliance, I'm going to go back and see for myself you're going to see what for yourself? Michael asks, incredulous. I'm going to meet Eric LeBlanc. I'm going back in time. You reply casually, as if explaining the rules of a board game. But how? It wasn't easy, you explain. My unusual inquiries at the library attracted the attention of a member of the Celestial Order of Magic, Miss Ellen Marr. She was interested. A maid senior? You know, a maid senior? Michael interrupts. A maid senior was the highest rank an initiate could attain in the order before advancing to the status of a wizard. 
it was a respectable position. Yes, and I was saying she took an interest in, an interest in my studies. She's young and wishes to raise herself even higher in the order, and she agreed to help me if I would give her credit in my pieces. She gave me instructions on how to build a time gate, a secret which is guarded well by the elite of the order, which requires a lot of mercury and the setup you see here. So now you see why you needed the mercury and where I'm going. And where are we going? Michael asked, still amazed. Or shall I say when? The year 1321, I want to witness the Battle of Baron Ford. Michael nods in disbelief. You open the bag of mercury and begin to pour it over the stone's gateway. Turning to the book, you follow the instructions told within. In several minutes, you have the ritual completed, except for one final step. You reach for a curved knife, laying under the book, take it, and bury the uh, and bury into your chest to the health. The pain is almost unbelievable, and within seconds you can feel your life draining away. You feel sluggish, and the pain subsides. You are dying. What are you doing? Michael screams. Must be on the brink of death, otherwise life forces interfere with magic. You stammer, blood dribbling from your mouth. Need you push me through the portal? But how do I come with you? Michael asks, quivering with anxiety. You don't, you reply wheezing. Michael pauses for several seconds, but realizing he has little choice, he bows his head and begins to drag you towards the now shimmering gateway of stones. Oh, but I have 200, and Michael is in the story. Mmm. That was easy. The uh, text is a lot more dramatic than the game, huh? A darkness suddenly implodes and the light is born. You gasp. Air rushes into, into you and uh, tastes sweet. Your lungs tingle as they fill with life giving gas with life giving gases. And then you remember the gaping wound in your chest as if it as if nerves were only dependent on your memory, pain suddenly shoots through you. You realize that your legs have gone numb and you're laying on the floor, blood pouring out of you and onto the cold stone. Your lungs suddenly contract, making breathing difficult. You feel dizzy and your vision blurs. Quickly, so as not to lose precious time, you fumble at your belt, searching for one of the life-giving potions that you uh, brought with you. Finally, you look at it, a small silk flask on your left side, you pull the stopper, your hands are shaking now, and you struggle while trying to bring the potion to your lips, which are frothed with blood. The potion tastes like liquid fire, and you gasp uh, and gag in pain as it goes down. You feel like screaming, like rampant flames are eating your entire body. Maybe that was a better choice than this, but no. It is receding now. You feel a slight tightening of your chest. You look down and are shocked to see a bloody hole in mending itself. Within minutes, uh, your chest, uh, still bloody, is covered in the skin again. You uh, feel it. Oh, you feel it just to be sure. The skin is raw and stings a bit, but otherwise seems real. Shaking your head, you stand up. Wow! Is all you can sputter while checking your body to make sure everything is all again. Suddenly, the portal is behind you. Having since gone dark, flares to life again. Swirls of brown color nearly be nearly blind you, and then, with a choking scream, another body issues forth, slamming into you. The two of you fall to the ground. What the? You say, turning the the body over, only to find bloody face of Michael staring at you. He is coughing and choking. Looking down, you see uh, your dagger biting into his stomach like a hungry snake. He tries to smile, but only gasps in pain. Ah, Damn you! He growl. What have you done? I wanted to. You need help. Adventure! He stammers. You roll your eyes and grab the second and last potion from your belt. It was supposed to be... For your return, in your anger, you get a brief moment of temptation to just let the poor idiot die. With a sigh of reson resonation and a last look at your safe return home, you unlock the flask and force Michael to drain its contents. 
which he does quickly. He gasps and grabs his throat, which you are surprised to see turn bright red for a moment, and then his spasms subside. For a moment he is quiet, but then he sits up. Wool! What a rush! He smiles. You, however, are in no mood for jokes. What do you think you're doing? You demand. Now you have no way to cure ourselves when we get uh, home. I can't get any more of those easily, my friend. Suddenly a horrible thought runs through your head. You quickly scan Michael's body and are dismayed to find he carries nothing but his bow and a knife. Where's the rest of the mercury? You ask him, grabbing him. He just shrugs. I'm sorry man, I was dying over there. I can't think of everything. <laughs> I mean, I'm reasonable, really. You push him away. Now what are we going to do? We're stuck here. You say angrily, gesturing at the darkened st stone walkway. Relax, beetle brains. This is an adventure. I'll just have to do a little of adventuring while you're out uh, booking around. He replies, standing up. Well, he asks, seeing it up moving. Let's go find this king of yours and hurry up. It's kind of cold in here. Okay. So this is the same place, but in a different time, right? So I was here. Now it's here. So in like whatever years it was. I don't know how exa how many years exactly I went back. But yeah. Currently the mine is occupied by dwarves. And later on it's gonna be like a ghost town. Why? Yeah, right now this uh, this place is um Yeah, pretty dwarf filled. Wanna talk little dwarf? I don't think that's a good idea, I guess. Alright, so we're gonna be in our home in the past, huh? Alright, let's go. A sudden sort of blast of cold, snowy air smashes into you, and as you embrace from the cave, grey ominous clouds smooth her out, uh, smother out uh, the blue sky above. Uh, the forest around you, choked with snow, smells like winter, smoke and wood. Although it is cold and snow covered, you recognize the small track, the small trail that winds uh, to the south almost immediately. Galen, you say in astonishment. Finally, allowing yourself to believe that this miracle of time travel has come to pass. Your house is only a little bit to the southwest. Of course, it's uh, not your house yet. Wackle shuffles uh, up behind you, uh, grumbling. You couldn't have taken a summer tropical, could, I, could you have? You bookies are all alike. Snow and rain and small stone rooms in the basement of your big towers. You guys need to learn the value of a bright sunny summer day. This sucks. He tucks his hands into his armpits and grumbles some more for good measure. Calm down, the big wimp, you child. Bear's Ford happened in winter. I certainly can't just change history to be accommodating to you. Come on, let's follow the trail. The King's Vines, keep out. The forest is noticeably more dense than it was um, the time from which you came. The sawmill to the north is smaller and younger looking. Several men can be seen in the distance singing while they process the logs brought back to the camp. It feels strange to see your home for so long sitting like an unattended corpse in the forest, so subtly brimming with life. You search around for a bit but can find no trace of your cottage. It must have been built sometime in the future. Come on, you say, you, you say finally to Michael and uh, after eating a bit. Let's keep going west. Uh, we'll eventually hit the coast and Galen Road. Mm -hmm. Alright. Galen Road uh, cuts into the pale... Yet pure white ground, like a scar cuts into the youthful face of an infant. Dirt and mud uh, churned up uh, by thousands of carts, and the horses yield more evidence of the war that should be at this time plaguing Galen. You quickly scribble a few notes in your journal. Which way now? Michael asks, finally catching up to him for an adventure. 
He certainly lacks stamina. Why, North, of course, you reply. That is the way to Gillendale, where I plan on meeting the king. Oh yeah, Michael Bites, back. The famous Sander Payne is going to waltz into Galen Keep, and Galen's greatest king will just drop everything to speak with him. Come on, man, king gonna talk to you. He's in Galen's king, uh, he is in Galen's greatest king, return. And he will see me, because I have this. You take out a small medallion that was previously hidden by your mini layers of clothing. Michael inspects it closely. It is a cast of gold and platinum and is shaped like an open hand. With an eye in the palm, a single dark red ruby forms the eye's uh, pupil. From a strictly monetary standpoint, it was worth a fortune. Where did you get that? You aren't a member of the Celestial Order, Michael whines. No, but King's LeBlanc will think so. Ellen Muller permitted me to borrow it temporarily. Okay, initiate pain, he replies sarcastically. Let's go talk to your king. I guess we will, huh? Okay, let's see around. So, that is Sir Alban, as we already saw. Then there's the monastery that we heard about from the sign. It's looking pretty similar to whatever we saw already. The hovels are unreachable. This is gonna be the beach. The zones of dwarves. Okay. Oh, by the way, what the hell happened? The Griffin Tower turned into a conservatory. Huh. Wait, how does that make sense? So there ended up being so many Griffins in the Griffin Tower? Wait, can I just buy some Griffins? I guess I can, right? Wow. Before you lies the great castle of Galen Dale, sitting sto stoically and watchful atop of the great pile of silk of rock, like a dragon surveying the land outside of uh, her cave, the historians say that the uh, Galen Dale has never been sacked in battle. Well, like, historians always say that uh, about the Love Castles, but whether or not the source truth, seeing the tall stone towers and um, crenellated walls, now you know that the mere sight of the fortress uh, would at the least would at the least give any attacking army a moment's pause ahead the great uh, porculus known as the talents gate lies open like a giant iron toothed mouth pikemen and uh, halberdiers uh, stand at attention paying no attention to the fan crowd passing both ways under the massive gates it is cold and windy and most pedestrians it seems chose to stay inside today Still, despite the apparent uh, sang Freud of the castle, you perceive a noticeable tension, a darting of guardsmen's eyes, a clenching of hands, nervous sticks. It is a wartime, and even in a seeming, seemingly impregnable stronghold such as this, the people must wander constantly. Will my life still be the same, or will I be a corpse? Hmm. All right. Yo, yo, Eric. Please, chapter read chapter one at this time. All right. You received with. Uh, you are received with what uh, could only be described as a stiff acceptance, and are led by a stodgy servant from the gate outside of the enormous castle to the king's offices. Um. All the while. Free of mine uh, is running the conversation that uh, will soon occur between you and the Kingdom of Eve's greatest monarch, Eric LeBlanc. You only hope you don't make a fool of yourself. Please reach out to one at this time. All right. And then we have the Ambassador Sage. This is the Sage that was given to us by. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, by the end of chapter one, we ended up uh, being given a sash. So this is what happened when we uh, walked with this guy, the narrator. Can we, like, walk there again? No? Okay. Whatever. So, yeah, we entered the castle. We ended up, um... I mean, yeah, I ended up doing that a little bit early. But no problem. 
We are... The king is no longer marching south, and now we're marching south. Wow, amazing. So, yeah, I guess we do that. So I guess that's what the quest guard is about. We need the ambassador to sign a show. And we're just going there, right? By the way, the, even the Archer's Tower is not flying. Most of the stuff is not flying. Hmm. Alright. Let's go then. To Baron's Ford we go. Several archers pace the narrow walkway along the midpoint of the tower. You call to the you call up uh, re to request passage, but the archers shake their heads. One replies, I'm sorry son, but it's a war out there. Don't you see? We can't just let anybody in through these days. We need proof that you and your men passed with order can with orders from King LeBlanc. So either he has to come himself or give you an official sash showing you are a member of the council. Sorry son, but them's the rules. The archers agree to let you buy in exchange for the ambassador sash. Do you wish to pass it this time? Why would they need the sash? Like, don't I only need to show it like one? As you pass the tower's checkpoints, you notice a very large uh, army camped about three miles down the road. Tents large and small, many of them brandishing with the blue and gold seal of King LeBlanc are scattered about the snowy white uh, valley like an ugly po like an ugly box men and even some women uh, dressed in soldiers uh, garb stroll casually about uh, stroll casually about some fully armored and others in their wool undergarments even from this distance you can hear the jarring noises of an army at rest before battle loud confident voices the name Neighing of the horses, the crash of sparing swords, sparring swords. You are about to spur your own mount forward, leading the small band of pikemen, which are, which accompanied you from the castle down to the uh, camp below. When a shout uh, comes behind you, you turn quickly in your saddle to see a man galloping on a horse uh, towards your position. You recognize him as one of the men from the guard tower you just passed. I'm sorry, my lord, he says, waving a blue sash in the air. You forgot this, and you may need it to convince Lord Alban of the truth of your words. Yeah, I, I said, like, why why you want to keep it? This was given to me by King. You thank the man and take the sash uh, from him. It feels strange being called my lord. You think to yourself as you prepare to make your way to the camp. The men of Galen's army eye you with some interest as you finally breach the uh, perimeter of the military encampment marked by sharpened wood, wooden stakes, and deep ditches. You show the gods your sash and they let you pass without hesitation. One of them offers uh, to direct you to Sir Alban's tent. You follow quietly, absorbed in your own thoughts, trying desperately to think of some way out of the, the present situation. It wasn't easy to come to the decision that it would be best not to tell Alban of the ambush ahead. But after much deliberation, you figured that it would come closest um, to the way history actually happened. After all, King LeBlanc hadn't known about it, and he managed to save the day. You enter Sir Alban's uh, tent, full of, uh, full of an ease. It is a larger structure, complete with no, with two separate bedrooms. Although the floor is still made of dirt and melting snow, several large men are hunched over a makeshift table in the back of the main room, arguing loudly amongst themselves. The man in charge, you presume, Sir Alban, distinguishable by his lavish blue cape and insignia marked uh, Polish arm polished armor, is standing up and watching his underlings argue over their battle plans. His arms folded casually across his chest. He does not look pleased, and his mustache is twitching with irritation. My lord, sir, the guard at your side announces, capturing the attention of the man around the table, a messenger from the king. Sir Alban stomps uh, towards you with more speed than you would have uh, thought possible, uh, encumbered as he was by his mail. It's about time! We've been here for weeks, waiting 
for word of his coming, he says. You give the man a bow. I am H. Bane of the Celestial Order. You say deftly, allowing your movements to naturally reveal the pendant uh, around your neck. And this, you add, indicating Michael behind indicating Michael behind you, is Michael of Harquin. Harquin. Albin considers you quietly for a moment, but then relaxes and says, Welcome, H. Bane. I apologize for my curtness, but as you can imagine, tensions are high right now. Reports are that small bands of undead are raiding the countryside to the south of Baron Ford. Chair pickers in the uh, Arcards um, have supposedly been eaten right on the job, and yet our king sits on his throne and worries over matters of state. What is he waiting for? If it pleases you, Lordship, I have orders from King himself. He wants you to move your army south and confront the undead armies. Our men in the Sagoria report that uh, Sagamiris himself moved through there less than a week ago. His main army is likely on the way north, and you are going to meet him in battle. He says that uh, he will join you shortly with the castle's garrison, but you're going to begin uh, making a progress to Baron's Ford without him. Finally, Sir Alban says with a barking laugh, we can get off our asses and do something. The other men at the table seem to leave to hear the news. We shall begin packing up immediately and we will be on the road within an hour, Corporal. He yells, bringing a guard, rushing into the tent uh, with a stiff uh, salute. Signal in the army! We are marching as soon as possible. The corporal salutes again and rushes out of his tent. I shall follow your army as an observer, if you don't mind. He tells Sir Alban after he is done directing his men. But wouldn't you rather stay under our protection? Alban asks. Uh, no, he replies. The order is um, of my wizard superior. Alagan shrugs, willing to let you do what you want. You collect your fists with anxiety, hoping you have done the right thing. Oh, there's one more thing, Alban says, recapturing your attention. You'll have to give me that sash so I can pass the checkpoint to the north of Baron's Ford. Regulations are strict these days, and even the king's army cannot pass without uh, the proper proof. You agree to Alban's wishes, turning to leave. You are surprised when Michael, uh, when Michael grabs you by the arm. There is an... There is an intensity in his eyes that you don't like. My friend, he says seriously, I wish to fight in the battle to come. Are you crazy? You'll get yourself killed! And besides, we're screwed up history enough. We shouldn't risk any further damage, you reply. I know, but I want to do this. I've always wanted to do this. He says, you open your mouth to argue, but the look on his face tells you that you won't convince him otherwise. Glenching your teeth, you leave the tent and hope uh, that this disaster of a situation can be salvaged. The worst part will be watching from afar, helpless to do anything. Why well, you not? Know, you must give Sir Alban the sash. Yeah, okay. There you go. Enjoy. Don't get ambushed or anything. Oh, shit. Um... Well, listen, uh, the thing that happens in the game is, like, far less, um, dramatic than what happens in the test. LOL. Um, can we get, a, like, an instant replay of that? Oh my god. Okay. You watch from afar as Albert and his army begin to cross the Barren River. What a vulnerable position they are in, you think to yourself. The entire cavalry div uh, division has been dismounted, desiring to lead their horses across instead of trying to navigate the treacherous rocky riverbed from atop their mounts. Soldiers and archers have put away their weapons so as not to get them wet. There is no noticeable formation. An ambush, you realize, would be perfect. Almost as if cruel, uh, cued by your thoughts, a sudden rush of screams and blood-cuddling cries assail your ears. Baron's Bridge, directly beside the ford, although too narrow and fragile for an army to cross, suddenly bursts into vigorous flames. The forest which comes right up uh, the river seems uh, to be alive. 
in all kinds uh, of shapes so rush out of it from the distance you can see men dying before they can even have a chance to draw a weapon mass chaos seems to be taking over alban's entire army and then you can see nothing too much smoke you must get closer to investigate nervously you spar your mouse forward he's already dead man we can't do anything it's fine the dead are everywhere the battle was almost over as quickly as it had begun by the time you reached the river alban's army had already been obliterated the details of combat are uncertain to you there are no survivors capable of relaying information those who lived had already retreated those who were wounded can only shake and mumble their eyes quivering in fear you walk among the dead with a heavy heart Something went wrong. LeBlanc's fortress were supposed to win this battle. It was supposed to be a magnificent victory. Then you remember LeBlanc wasn't here, and nor was the Castle Guard or Jared Morgan. What have you done? What consequences will this have on the future, you know? On the future, you know. And a little bit of army, I guess. What? Now? I guess I'm here now? This is Vertigo. The light um, intrudes upon your peaceful sleep. Where is this place? You wonder. You wonder. A small citadel tucked away in a, slow, in a snowy hollow stands in a stark contrast to the vast emptiness around you. You, ju you just exited from this building again you know not why it is just oh it is just an empty building carved from the very uh, rock on which it sits you come here often every night it seems but what is night anymore night and day they are all the same to you black nothingness the details of how you got there elude you the battle that was so long ago now it seems was it days weeks longer you tried to run, you tried to run so hard, running and running, until it felt like swords jabbing into your side. Looking back, you were dismayed to see they were keeping up uh, with your pace. And, the, and they were but lifeless corpses, they weren't going to tire. When you finally collapse in exhaustion and pain, each breath uh, feeling like you were taking in fire rather than air, they pounce on you immediately. Like uh, wolves finally tracking down a wounded deer. Despite your terrible position, it was hard uh, to feel angry or sad. In fact, you were relieved. At least you had thought the nightmare would end. That they would kill you and it would be over. The world has ruined. The world was ruined anyway and it was all your fault. The world would thank the necromancers for ending your worthless life. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Well, yeah, Sanders have been... Uh, I'd made an oopsie! <laughs> but alas, they didn't kill you. No, they simply surrounded you, poking you with their rusty swords. Though most had no flesh on their faces, you could swear they were smiling, laughing. Finally, after several minutes of abuse, the necromancer's, um, necromancer you had seen earlier approached on his horse. Without even a gesture or a spoken word from, uh, from him, the undead rabble that uh, you corner, or oh, the head you corner backed off, enabling him to dismount and approach you. You had looked, you had looked around uh, desperately for anything you could use as a weapon, but all you could manage was a fistful of snow. Sagamiris, or at least that's who you assume it was, was in no mood to be pleasant. He picked you up with uh, 
one bony hand and brought your face within two inches of his own, who realized with astonishment that he was human, where before you could have sworn was only blackness and glowing eyes was a human face, bleak and pale was a rainy day, with an ugly nose and jack teeth uh, and sinful eyes that would make a little child have nightmares for years. Ah, he breathed, blowing the smell of death and sulfur into your nose. You're the one, the one I have felt. My name is Sagimiris, he sneered. But I presume you know that already. I'm not sure what you've done, how you did it, or why, but you, my little magician, mageling, are mine. The necromancer's words did not make sense to you, but you had little time to ask for clarification, for without um, taking another look at you, he tossed you roughly on the ground and issued a verbal order to nobody in particular to immobilize you. Which meant, unfortunately, the flat of a blade to the face. When you gained consciousness, you were in a dark, dreary place. That was so long ago, but without the sun, to gauge uh, the days, you, had, you have no idea how long, and every time you fall asleep, you visit this place. Though you have no idea why, a voice calls for you, from the south, always follow it, to the same end every time. Hmm, we're getting some knowledge, huh? Alright. The voice echoes again, beckoning you forward. You can't pinpoint its origin, and you've never met the speaker. You have before wandered off uh, this road and met with little success. One time, you recall, you had walked east for what must have been hours, only to arrive again at this very road, as if you were only standing on some miniature, spherical world. The only place you can go is south. Again voice calls, but never does it mention your name. The man, it uh, calls, sounding like a wind. You must bring me that which I need. You must, the voice is urgent. Well, only I can make things right. Who are you? You scream loudly. Your voice does not echo. Why? What do I need to bring you? You ask for the hundredth time, and... Where do I bring it? Again the answer. The voice only repeats itself. Only I can make things right. You sigh, pulling your clothes around you, you around you to keep the, out the cold. To the south, you see the game. You walk through it every time, but it never takes you anywhere. Always the same thing happens. Hello. Mushy mosh. You wake up with a jolt and the real world hits you like a rock. The place is the same as you remember, except your water bowl has been changed while you were asleep. Always when I enter the gate, you mutter, clutching your aching head. The voice always tells me, it isn't ready yet, and then I wake up. It isn't ready yet, huh? Okay. As a reflex, you survey your living quarters again. If they can be called, if they can be called that, a single room about six meters to the side. The walls formed by thick iron bars. The floor is wet and smells of urine and human excrement. Most of it is yours, although because the whole place slopes uh, towards your own cell, the waste of um, inmates further down seem to flow to. Uh, Float to you and collect in the corner right where you sleep. You can hear the uh, scurrying of rats and the sickening coughs of dying people in the distance. At first you had tried to keep uh, track of how long you have been here. You did this by putting scratch into the wall every time a meal was brought, but the wall filled up and you were forced uh, to abandon the plan. Meals are brought to you at almost uh, painfully long intervals by the time some uh, grimy fat human guard, although the food itself uh, is nothing to look forward to. The guard himself eats uh, most of the good things, leaving you with bark, bugs, and if you are lucky, the occasional running piece of meat or fruit. You choke it down because your stomach asks for it, but you have considered on more than one occasion 
uh, tasting the damn straw mattress on which you sleep to see if it has any more flavor. With a painful groan, you sit up. Again, you take a note of how awful you smell. It makes you want to gag, and despite the fact that you don't get many opportunities to socialize, you collect your arms uh, reflexively against your body. You can't do this for long. However, for your hair and new bed are both crawling with bugs, just like your bed and your food, for that matter, and they itch dreadfully. You are in the middle of your usual morning routine, which consists of stretches, rock lifting, to keep your muscles from uh, atrophying, when a sudden sound comes from your, uh, captures your attention. Is that a human voice? Is it coming from uh, the vaulted gate of your cell? You drop the rocks uh, and move to investigate. Okay, so we're moving to investigate, eh? I think that's gonna be enough for today. So, part one end. So, we already have a pretty rough idea of what the map is gonna be like. And we also, uh, yeah. It uh, currently finally done. I mean, the name of the map suddenly makes sense. Sanders' painful mistake, eh? Okay. So, that's how it goes, huh? It's gonna be probably like a really narrative-driven type of map. Maybe there's gonna be puzzles, maybe there's gonna be combat, I honestly have no idea. Or maybe it's just gonna be like a story that's gonna be told. Either way, it does actually seem like it's actually good fun. So I'll probably continue through it. And um, yeah, let me know if you actually like this type of map and this type of content. I don't really feel like I'm a very good narrator. Cause, you know, I like stumble on my speech and everything. I realize that. But, you know. I do my best if this is uh, something that you'd like to see. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed part one, and see you next time. Bye bye. Till next.